to continue in organizing such event, which is part of our promotional activities uh, in, in order to strengthen the trade between Italy and US in the pharma. Uh, you should know that uh, Italy in Europe is one of the first producers in the pharma. And at the same time, uh, this is one of the main components of our export here uh, in the US, the first component after the well-known mechanical and fashion. Uh, but uh, uh, the pharma is also a very relevant sector of attraction of foreign investments in Italy, and that's why we are organizing this event to show you what Italy, what are the trends uh, between our two industries. So I will leave the floor to our Consul General, Sergio Strozzi, and to, then to Antonino Laspina, and then we will enter into the round table moderated by our colleague and friend, Brad Logan. So thanks for attending. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Uh, first of all, let me say, it's a great honor for me to be here uh, this evening. Um, JP Morgan Conference, uh, we don't need to talk about that, it's a very crucial event worldwide. Uh, as much as uh, as if our uh, healthcare, healthcare, and uh, and the uh, pharma industries are concerned, and we strongly wanted this consulate general here in San Francisco to organize today's event together with our colleagues uh, from the Italian trade agency, Alessandra Antonino, who will take the floor after me, uh, because we know that uh, this event has been done in the past years. Then the pandemic it and uh, obviously we had sort of break, but we needed to uh, wrap it up and take it back again together with you. Uh, this is a crucial sector for both Italy and the US. I'm talking about pharma and, and the health tech. And this is a sector where Italy is leading in Europe more and more, thanks to the great companies, the very grown-up companies we have in Italy. And I'm talking to, I'm, in front of some of the most eminent uh, representatives of the Italian industry in this sector. And I'm so glad that we can welcome all of you here, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, investors, all of them in the field of health tech and uh, healthcare and, uh, and pharmaceutical uh, industry. And we want to stress out that Italy can be a great partner, an outstanding partner for uh, U.S. companies and U.S. investors in this in this field, and we would like this event today uh, to be an occasion for you to mingle, to mix up, and to uh, start a cooperation uh, between our uh, two countries. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you, and then I leave the floor to your colleague from New York, uh, as Consul General uh, of Italy in San Francisco, I'm so proud to welcome you here at the new Italian Innovation and Culture Hub. Nickname is Innovit, as you see. And uh, the lobby is the one, well, right, yeah, close to Invitalia and Meet. And uh, we've opened it, as Alessandro was saying, uh, not last year, actually, two years ago, right now, yeah, 2023. So, end of 2021. And this is a new concept for Italian institution being abroad and promoting our business ecosystems and innovation ecosystems as well. <coughs> uh, inside the, uh, the new Italian Innovation uh, and Culture Hub, uh, there are three subjects operating. The um, Innovation Center, which is run by a private company, and I'm glad to introduce to you the director of the Innovation Center uh, at Innovit. Alberto Cito, please wave so everyone can recognize you. It's a big challenge. We are starting an uh, acceleration program for Italian startups uh, to uh, contaminate with the uh, Silicon Valley ecosystem very soon. The first batch will be in March. So please uh, keep tuned and uh, keep you know, posted uh, on, on the, the website of innovitasf.com to know more about our activity. The second subject is each the Italian trade agency with two desks. And then the third one is the Italian uh, Culture Institute, because we believe very much, and this is typical Italian, uh, since centuries probably, uh, since Leonardo or, or, or something like that, uh, we want to mix culture, education, scientific cooperation, and business. And that's why we created with the Italian government and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, specifically this place. I'm so glad to welcome you in. 
So uh, thank you very much to all of you for being here, especially the ones uh, who are coming from New York. I already talked to some of them and I thank them, and our moderator, for example, Brad Longer. Thank you very much for joining us. The investors I was talking to from the East Coast, from Silicon Valley as well, and uh, enjoy the event and enjoy also the networking event we're going to have after, after this uh, very interesting panel. Let me also thank, uh, before I give the floor to Antonino, uh, Pierluigi Petrone, uh, the president, for co-organizing with us and all the association, the Pharma Association from Italy, for co-organizing with us this event. Uh, I think we've made it. We were doubtful because there were so many problems, but we made it all together, and this means that when we are a team, when we play in a team, we can succeed and we can make it. Grazie a tutti. Antonino Laspina, director of the Italian Trade Agency office in New York. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sergio. Well, I'm very happy, delighted to be here. I would like to welcome all of you to this event. Event that is mainly characterized by what I call the continuity. As a matter of fact, we have been able to continue with this kind of activity that we started several years ago which means uh, is the opportunity for Italian companies to interact with uh, relevant companies, investors uh, on the occasion and in coincidence with the JP Morgan healthcare event. In the past, this event was um, a kind of experiment that we have conducted. Today, as has been already mentioned by uh, Sergio, by the Consul General here in San Francisco, is uh, a kind of event that is uh, signaling the maturity we will want to say of this event. Because we are here in a very important uh, uh, venue, is the Innovit, is the center, and we are coming uh, here after a long journey through the innovation. Continuity means that uh, it's no more an occasional moment, the moment where the Italian Trade Agency and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are organizing events such as this one. We are coming from a very important events such as the one that we organized during the CS in uh, Las Vegas. Everybody knows how important is this as a window for the technology and innovation. Italy was there with some 51 startups and some of them were in, uh, related to the healthcare. This means that uh, innovation is, let me say, I would like to borrow uh, an expression from Galileo Galilei, yet it moves. In Italy, innovation is moving. It's moving very fast. And the result is uh, positive because uh, public and private are now uh, working together. There has been a definition of a new scheme of collaboration. We have seen, for instance, Casa Deposite Prestiti to be involved in the promotion and financing of some activities related to the innovation. And an agency like the Italian Trade Agency, under the aegis of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, now is in a position to make sure to secure this kind of events, not only during the event like JP Morgan, but also in many other events. I would like to say, for instance, for San Diego Biotech or other events that are more and more of certain interest for the Italian companies. Having said that, I would like once again to thank all of you for coming here. I would like to thank the panelists. I'm sure that after this event, we are going to have some positive developments. And the Italian Trade Agency with the network offices here, the headquarters in Rome, and the professional people that are involved in our activity will be able to follow your uh, expectations and to secure possible positive results for the future. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. <laughs> Isn't this a beautiful location? Great place to have an event. Um, so let me introduce myself. My name is Brad Longcar. I'm a biotech investor, and I'm not Italian. Tonight I am. <laughs> I was not born Italian. But a few years ago, I met a very smart and very hardworking entrepreneur, Pier Luigi Paracchi, who is now has his company listed on the NASDAQ, the world capital of biotech company listings. And I wanted to help him, and I've become an advisor to his company, and it has really opened my eyes to Italian innovation. And Italian innovation is making news and helping patients today. 
So for example, one of the co-founders of Genenta Science, Per Luigi's company, is Luigi Naldini. And one of the things that he's world famous for is we call him the father of the Lenti virus. He and his colleagues were the first scientists to discover how to use the Lenti viral vector for gene transfer. And this summer in the United States, the first two gene therapies that use the Lenti viral vector were approved for a disease called beta thalassemia and cerebral adenoleukodystrophy. They are two of the first big gene therapies to be approved in the United States and to be changing patients' lives. And so that's just one example of the innovative work, the innovative science that's happening in Italy today that's really making waves globally. And we're here for the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference, and when people ask me what is the theme for you of this year's conference, it's an easy answer. I say globalization, globalization, globalization. Especially with the last few years that we've had, sadly, with you know, COVID all around the world, countries and regions everywhere understand the importance of biology and medicine to the future. And foreign companies and Italian companies are at the forefront of that globalization and making global news. So on Sunday night, the most important news, I believe, that was announced at the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference was by an Italian company. Chiesi bought Amrit for $1.5 billion. And it just goes to show how Italian companies are a force in that globalization that's happening in our, in our industry. So with that, um, we've got a great panel tonight. And first, we're going to watch a brief video about the life sciences ecosystem uh, in Italy. And it's going to be presented by uh, President Bogetti of Cluster Alice. Good afternoon to the participants of the ITAN and the World 2023, a side event organized by ITAN during the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. I apologize for not being present in person among all of you. Unfortunately, I had to cancel my participation and record this video, as in these days I'm involved with a series of institutional meetings with a new set of government related to the well-known MedDev payback issue. Let me first introduce what Alize is. Alize is the Italian technological cluster wanted by the Ministry of University and Research a few years ago as an integrator between the public and private entities of the complex life science Italian ecosystem. Alize is a vast social structure with prestigious members like the five national industrial associations, the four national research institutes, and the 14 local entities expressed by their regional administrations. Alize embraces the view of becoming a protagonist and a promoter of the needs and development potential of the whole sector. The cluster is committed to ensuring inclusion and openness to its action as much as possible. Life science is a strategic sector in Italy, a key asset to allow the resilience of the country to different challenges. Such a role implies the definition and universal access to treatments, the healthcare sustainability facing demographic changes and unpredictable and sudden shocks like the recent pandemic. The value chain is also strategic to the competitiveness of the economic system, for the added value it generates and for its pivotal role in research and innovation. The value chain of healthcare, with all its players, must be a strategic partner of the economic and social system, not only for satisfying the demands of citizens, but also for its enabling role across all economic social activities as it represents an engine of development for the entire country. This side event aims to focus on small and medium enterprises and startups, enabling their growth through innovation financed by the attraction of investments. To set the frame, let me briefly give you a perimeter of the value of this industrial sector. In Italy, life science is up to 250 billion euro in turnover in 2021. 105 billions in any value, 
and that was 6% of Italian GDP and 1.8 million of workers. The R&D of pharmaceutical, medical device and biotech industries is equal to approximately 3 billion euro per year, 11% of the total income. Alongside industry figures, Italy stands out for the high quality of its scientific research. Italian research has been confirmed as one of the most productive globally in terms of publication and citations. The vitality of Italian research also resulted in intense patenting activity. 2,000 life science patents were filed in 2020 at the Italian Patent and Trademark Office with a consistent growth of plus 45% compared to 2009. The number of venture capital and private equity investments in high tech companies in Italy confirms the competitiveness of life science and attractiveness of the ecosystem. In 2020, life sciences were the primary investment target with 68 bills, 40% of the total. These investments also show a consolidated growth trend in recent years. Since 2017, life sciences have steadily been the leading sector in terms of the number of investments in high tech companies with a growth of plus 143%. Italy is also facing a critical challenge driven by its demographic evolution that will bring 60% of Italians to be over 60 years of age in 2030. Italians are the second longevity population in the world, but unfortunately, the quality of the last 10 years of their life is one of the worst among the developed countries. For this reason, Italy must place healthcare at the heart of its political agenda. The Recovery Plan funds, namely the Mission 6, Healthcare and Mission 4, Research, represent a unique opportunity in the next three years. Since the public-private partnership will enable the choice of projects to be financed by these funds, Alize, by its nature and scope, will play a fundamental role in this game. Thank you for your attention. If I can please ask my panelists to take their seats. So while everyone's getting settling, uh, getting settled, I just highlight like to highlight one thing that I'm very impressed by and very proud of is we have a great mixture in this crowd today. We have a lot of colleagues who have traveled from Italy who are you know, the innovators who are bringing their innovation here to the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference. We also have a lot of U.S. investors, a lot of U.S. business development people, a lot of representatives from companies who may be looking for innovation that can be found from Italy. And the goal of this event tonight, and the theme of my panel is I want to be a connector, and I want everyone in this room, depending on which side you are, to understand how to make that connection going forward. So if you're the Italian company, and you're looking to be a big part of that globalization that's happening in our industry, and you want to succeed in the United States and other players, <coughs> what do you need to know? What can, what can we do to arm you to achieve the highest success? And I also want our US investor, company, and business development friends to walk out of here today having a strong feel for Italian innovation. And if you want to act on it, if you want to look for innovation, if you want to partner with an Italian company, to really understand how to do that. So I'm going to start with Italian companies succeeding in the United States. And I'd like to start with my colleague and my friend Per Luigi from Genenta Science because he's really the beacon. He, his company, Genenta Science, is the only today Italian company listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. I am so proud of his achievement in making that happen. And he's laid the groundwork and showed other companies how to achieve that. And so let's talk about that today, Paralogy. So in your journey as an entrepreneur, and as you were deciding where to list, you had a decision. You know, do you want to list on a European exchange? 
do you want to list on NASDAQ? Walk us through like the decision process that you went through and how you ultimately ended up on NASDAQ. And throughout that process, what were the things that were challenges for you from being from you know outside of our country? And also, what were the advantages do you think that you had in your pocket coming at this from a different perspective that helped you achieve that success? Wow. I have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, I think that it's important to learn how to swim because you need to cross the ocean. <laughs> this is not easy. But anyway, when we, we discuss a lot about the market, uh, and you know, NASDAQ is, uh, for market companies, is the more, uh, it's very competitive, but there is so many competencies. And really understand the quality of the science, even if you are an early stage company or pre clinical, or in our case, early clinical company. And I think that when you want to decide where to find the right place for a uh, Go public for an IPO, it's important to see where your peers are. And uh, in this market, there are maybe after last year less competition because a lot of companies are not performing very well. Anyway, there are all my peers are in this, are listed here in the US, not only US company, but also European company that wanted to increase their value added. Yeah, so, and this create the opportunity to have so many bankers, so many investors, so many uh, people specialized in understanding the things that really can make the difference and can create value. And coming at it from, you know, perspective of, you know, coming from Italy, what were some of the challenges that you overcame, maybe, that a U.S. company might not be challenged with, and what were the assets that you had, you know, coming from with a different mindset and from a different place that you think helped you achieve yeah. this? We leverage a lot on the quality of the science. As you said at the beginning of our conversation, so Geninta is the, the last step of a journey long 25 years. And uh, in Italy, in Milano, not a lot, a lot of people are aware that first ever ex vivo gene therapy has been approved not in Silicon Valley or in Boston, but in Milano, thanks to the collaboration between San Rafael Hospital and Janine has been out from San Rafael Hospital and a multinational company. We have top scientists. I see here in, in, in the audience that there is Maria Grazia Roncarolo. Where is Maria Grazia? <laughs> and she's one of the mother of the cell therapy in the world. As you mentioned, Nadine, that is well known as the father of the lentivirus technology. And this is an incredible track record, high quality science, and this was what we used to enter in this market, present ourselves, and we learned a lot on the quality of the science. Excellent. Um, I'd like to introduce the audience to a friend of mine, Patrick Nosker. He's the head of research at a hedge fund in New York called Affinity Asset Advisors. And he gets embarrassed when I say this, but I truly mean it. He is the most impressive and smartest investor that I know. He's already a big name in our industry. He will be the biggest name in biotech investing um, in the coming years. He is truly that smart. So Patrick, we're here at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. You've probably had 30 company meetings maybe 50 company meetings this week. Um, as you meet with companies, what advice do you have to them to succeed when they're sitting across the table from you? And you meet with companies from all over the world. Is there anything that you notice that like, you know, foreign companies do different? Or any advice that you might have to foreign companies that you know, if they're new to kind of like the U.S. biotech in the sector and being in front of like global investors, like, you know, maybe something that they could, you know, a piece of advice to help them succeed more so that when they're on the other side of the table of the smartest investor in biotech, that they succeed and they get the investment. What advice do you have for companies? Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, I think for investing in biotech, the, the most important thing is the science, right? Science doesn't work, nothing else matters. 
Um, so being able to clearly uh, articulate what you have, why it's differentiated, and you know, where it could serve a, a place in the market is really important. Um, I think also, you know, as you mentioned, listing in the U.S. is certainly advantageous for U.S. investors. Um, the U.S. has pretty strict requirements with regards to auditing and reporting and uh, maintaining a, a firewall between non-public information and investors. Um, and it, it's, it's a lot easier for us to get comfortable when we know that they're you know, abiding by SEC requirements. Um, we do have some ex-US investments that aren't listed here, but, but for the most part, it, it, um, it's very difficult to convince you know, our, our investment committee that it's worthwhile to take that risk. Um, so yes, US listing is, is certainly a, a really good pro. Um, but, but I think the most important thing for biotech, uh, you know, whether it's a private or public company, is to be able to clearly tell a story and, and stand up to the scientific rigor that you be subject to. You know, I think there are a lot of very smart investors. Most people that do what we do have you know, many, many years of education, you know, PhD or MD or PharmD, and they understand how to rip apart any sketchy data. Right? They, they know how to, to find the holes in the story, and um, being able to already know the answers to the questions that will be asked is, is really important. And you know, I feel like as an investor myself, 10 years ago, the places that we looked for science were very crowded. You know, we looked for science out of like Harvard or Memorial Sloan Kettering, a handful of places. And I feel like today there's so much innovation coming from all over the world that it's like day and night different. Do you experience that as well? Absolutely. I think, you know, we've seen a number of, of successes um, outside the sort of conventional PC hubs, right? Uh, just as an example, right, Lacanumab just got approved. That was a European discovery, right? Um, something where, where very few people that do what I do were looking. Um, the, you know, just in Italy, the, you know, for hemophilia, the Padula variant of, of one of the factors was discovered, and that will likely be the, uh, the gene therapy construct of choice for hemophilia B. Um, so I think there's, there's plenty of great science and discoveries that, that, have, um, that aren't yet in Boston or San Francisco, right? And uh, being able to identify those and leverage them and then connect them to the right investor base quickly uh, is key because you know, the, the most important thing, I think, uh, for, for the US is, is IP. And the longer you take to try to get that idea uh, put forward to have funding, you know, the, the worse off you are. So being able to quickly execute, quickly tell the story is, is important, but yeah, plenty of great science elsewhere. Uh, you know, Italy is, is I was just joking that uh, a lot of the, you know, the scientists 500 years ago, 400 years ago, they have Italian last names, right? And there's, there's, definitely, there's definitely a lot of great science that goes on out there. And so um, I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, of hidden proof. Great. So Patrick comes at this from the perspective of like a stock market investor. And, you know, it's key to make an impression there. We also have a great panelist, Don Bell, from a multinational pharmaceutical company, Novartis. And Dawn has a long career, and she's been the global development head of strategic partnerships. You know, science is a, a very uh, partnership-oriented activity, and you vet companies from all over the world. What has been your impression of European and Italian innovation, and as somebody from a pharmaceutical company like that, what do you look for in the people sitting across the table from you, and what have you seen makes for the best strategic partnerships? What is it that people bring to the table that you know make it succeed to the fullest? Thanks, thanks Brian, for the question. And I guess I'd also add, in addition to you know having you know, been at Novartis for ten years and in partnering for the past ten years, for, the, for five years I've actually been mentors, a uh, mentor to seed stage companies um, in North America and Europe. And through the Gold Track program and the uh, Creative Destruction Lab, I've met uh, so many seed stage companies, including two of my Italian founders in the back row back there <laughs> that I've worked with uh, uh, in the past who are doing amazing work. Um, so. It is absolutely true that 
science knows no borders, right? So great science can occur everywhere. I think it is well known that Italy punches above its weight, if I may use an American colloquialism, um, in, uh, in gene therapy and, and many other fields of science. Uh, clinical trials, so we have some of our best clinical trial sites when I was working on our heart fire program uh, you know, in, in Italy. And, um, and, and what we look for, I think the most important thing for companies to understand um, when you're partnering with a very large pharma company is it's, you know, things need to be strategic. Um, and so really understanding what that company is looking for, how it complements their pipeline, um, and, and how it fits their commercial structure in terms of like, you know, where, where this drug might, might be marketed. And then the other thing that I think a lot of companies maybe miss when partnering with very large pharma is materiality. So if your asset is a relatively small asset or a rare disease asset and that company doesn't have rare disease in the strategy, um, that product that you're developing may not be large enough for them to have interest. So, you know, for our, you know, Novartis was an example of looking for at least a billion dollar peak revenue, uh, global peak revenue, and sometimes that's, you know, depending on, you know, the complementarity with other parts of the portfolio, may not be a large enough um, revenue stream. And then the reason is, is that, you know, we're looking for mid to, you know, um, mid single digit growth, we'll call it, uh, I think was the guidance. and. Um, and we have a $50 billion revenue stream. So to grow on that kind of base, you need larger products to do that because you just you don't have the bandwidth to put together too many smaller products to make that kind of growth. And so I think the economics and the strategy are really important for companies to consider when approaching their partners. But again, you know, great science, great data, uh, knows no borders. Um, one of the things that I'm fascinated by is how do small companies get in touch with large companies like yours? There's an entrepreneur that's in this room, or you know, sitting in a lab in Milano right now, you know, who wants to partner with Novartis. What it, what are the steps for them to to reach out and call you? Um, I know that's a very simple question, but you know, there people want to know that. I wish I had a simple answer. Um, you know, it, it depends, right? So I think the easiest, the best way, and you had talked about this in our in our prep session is a, is a warm introduction. So using your network, if you if you know as a company use your board's network. You know I think people sometimes younger companies I feel don't really leverage their boards as well as they could. Um, and so that is the, absolutely the best way is to get a warm introduction um, and to, to help someone help you to navigate. Uh, if you are interested in a lab somewhere and you're more an academic, getting your, your research out there at conferences, meeting with scientists, you know, our scientists do go to conferences, you know, getting and, you know, connecting with scientists with your published peer-reviewed data is going to be very helpful because it's the scientists, especially for very early work, it's the scientist opinions on the quality of the research that will really uh, drive the day uh, more than the business development relationship. And uh, Patrick, I'd like to go back to you. You talked about like how science is key, king. And you know, one of the things that I think is really important is medical meetings. And one of the great things about medical meetings is I think that smaller players can get noticed at medical meetings. You know, if you've got a poster, the best investors are walking around the poster hall, you know, trying to find like the hidden secret of the medical meeting. So that's an important way for people to get noticed on a global scale. So why don't you talk a little bit about the importance of medical meetings and getting noticed that way. Yeah, that's that's a, a really good point. So, you know, in thinking about companies that we're invested in, um, about half we find out about, you know, through the banking side, right? They're ones that we meet at JP Morgan or other banking events. The other half are ones that we find organically at medical meetings. So, you know, there's a, as an example, one of our private companies, we saw a, a really interesting poster at Ash one year, and we we seeded the company, and now it's going you know, to raise our Series B, and you know that's something that everyone else missed basically because you know they weren't looking for it. Um, it it's not always a preclinical asset or, or or something like that. Uh, sometimes you have pharma projects that get abandoned because they don't hit that one billion dollar a year revenue stream, and it gets out licensed, right? And maybe a company takes over, presents the old pharma's data, and it's intriguing. Uh, and it was never shown before, because pharma companies don't need to show their phase one data, right? It's not material for them. So being able to see these things in the context at a medical meeting, hearing the, you know, seeing who's coming to the poster, who's interested, you know, are there are there physicians that go to the poster presenter and say, I want to use this, how do I get a, a person on a trial? You know, that's that's really exciting to us. Yeah, and, and 
And medical meetings are truly international events. Like there's no club or admission, like they're welcome to all who have great science. So it is a fantastic and really important way to get noticed. So I want to mention, by the way, we'll have time at the end for Q&A, but I like to keep panels you know, dynamic. So if anyone in the audience has a question about something we've already said or that something we say, please raise your hand and we're happy to give you a wireless <coughs> mic and just kind of keep this interactive. So I'd like to kind of turn the floor over to some of our Italian company friends and to really highlight the innovation and the work that they're doing so that our U.S. investor and company representatives and business development folks have a better idea of all of the amazing work that's happening in Italy today. I want to start with Fabrizio. And, you know, I mentioned the biggest news, I think, of J.P. Morgan, at least Sunday night, was this large acquisition by an Italian company of a rare diseases company. I know you focus a lot in orphan indications. Why don't you introduce yourself, your company, and highlight some of the innovative work that you're doing? Thanks. Uh, CT is an ophthalmic company, so we really focus on eye care. And uh, alongside uh, the, the traditional business that is retail, pharma, and some kind of devices, we are on a journey uh, to achieve uh, a potentially transformational um, accomplishment uh, for, for, our, um, for a company of our size. And that is uh, uh, the development of an orphan drug uh, that has uh, a couple of indications uh, which we already, um, uh, um, where we already received uh, uh, the designation by the US FDA. Uh, we are halfway through the uh, approval process in Europe uh, with the European Medicine Agency. And we believe that, uh, as usual, the biggest market potential is here in the US. Um, uh, it's an it's uh, ultra-rare uh, uh, disease, uh, but still there's a higher med medical need. And coming back to the point that was raised uh, by some of the panelists, uh, as long as the science is there, the med need is there. And you have a good ID, uh, you have some exclusivity, uh, really. Uh, this is where you should focus to uh, look at US as an opportunity uh, to, to, to make uh, not only a difference uh, for the company, but most importantly for the patients. Uh, and, and this is where uh, I believe uh, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can play a role. Uh, but of course, there are the challenges that were mentioned earlier on in terms of how you get to the US. And that's where partnering is, is one of the options that we, we, we are considering. Uh, and um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we're, why we're here. And you mentioned that you have orphan drug status here in the United States with the US FDA. Can you talk about, as a foreign company, what it's been like you know, collaborating with the FDA and how easy or difficult that has been? Like, what has been your experience? Well, of course, this is a, a first for a company like, uh, like ours, uh, as it is a first uh, uh, working with the EMA uh, to get that approval. Uh, and, and I guess what we still are at an early stage as we plan to file the NDA later in the year. So far, uh, it's, been, uh, it's been an interesting journey uh, because what I would uh, uh, mention about the difference that we have experienced is that uh, when you deal with uh, US authorities, you probably, um, I wouldn't say know what to expect, uh, but the process is more, um, uh, I would say, clear in, in, in some respect. Whereas uh, navigating uh, the complexities uh, of Europe uh, makes uh, perhaps a uh, harder return on the investment. Uh, you do a lot in Europe, but then uh, you have a fragmented system, whereas in the US you appreciate uh, uh, the fact that uh, it's more of a single market than Europe is. Uh, and of course, the commercial opportunities much bigger. And I think another key point, if people aren't familiar with this, is <coughs> FDA and uh, EMA both belong to something called ICH. <coughs> and ICH is designed to harmonize regulatory standards by you know, members that participate in that. And so to develop a drug in Europe and to develop a drug in the United States and to get it through regulators, is a very similar process. And so if you're learning you know, how to succeed in Europe through the EMA, you've already won three-fourths of the battle because the, from a regulatory standard, they're collaborating so that it's harmonized and so that you know, they have the same standards and the same playbook um, for drug development. And I think it makes it a lot easier for European companies to succeed in the United States 
and for U.S. companies to succeed by having Europe a part of their global development process. Um, so, Paulo, why don't I turn it over to you? Um, please introduce yourself and you know talk about the work that you're doing. Yeah, um, we actually we are a little bit ambitious because we are in the G therapy field, but we are fostering an approach which I call gene therapy 2.0 because we are not uh, now dealing with the monogenic disease uh, where you simply put, uh, replace a defective gene, but we are dealing now with complex diseases such as type 1 diabetes, multiple sclerosis. So the idea is to utilize gene therapy as a neuromodulatory uh, tool to revert the root cause of these diseases. Um, we have also another program in CAR T cells for myeloid disorders, but that's, that's the first program uh, that we will we launch in the clinic next year, is, uh, is the most ambitious one. Um, I think that for a company like ours in, uh, in Italy, uh, I think it would be important maybe, because everybody understands that US is an opportunity. You know? uh, Pierluigi clearly paved the way for all of us. And, uh, but I'm not sure that is is as clear as uh, uh, for U.S. investors that maybe Italy and Europe do represent an opportunity. And, and this is because of many reasons. The, the first is that the level of science is at least comparable. In some specific areas, it might be even better than, uh, than the U.S. one. So it's not a problem of going into a region where the science is not as good as here. Um, but it's an opportunity because valuation of the companies is usually much less than in the United States. So uh, my company here would be probably valued double. Um, the uh, clinical development is much cheaper. So if you want to, the, not only the, the cost of patient, but also the overhead of institutional supply uh, to run a clinical trial is completely different as compared to the United States. So you buy something cheaper and the cost of development are much cheaper. So this represents an opportunity. And the more U.S. investor comes to uh, Italy, to Europe, the more they could actually bridge the gap to allow companies such as Genenti to go to NASDAQ easily, in an easier way. So I think this should be considered as a, as, a, as a way of uh, looking at uh, these kind of opportunities, maybe in a, in a, in a more global uh, way. I, I notice a lot when I meet with Italian companies that gene therapy comes up a lot. Um, yourself, Per Luigi's technology is very gene therapy. What is it about Italy um, that, that that is the that is the pushing the envelope of science. That's where medicine is going. What is it about Italy that um, all of that gene therapy science seems to be you know, coming out of there as a region? Um, I think that, as Noam mentioned, it's not the only field. Because, for instance, cardiology is a, we have very, very important clinical centers. My experience is, uh, is in, in gene therapy since the past 20 years. And, uh, uh, Maria Grazia Moncarolo, Charlie Bordignon, Luigi Nandini, uh, were all you know, key players in developing this field in Italy. And actually it was a journey uh, to which I participated on one angle uh, that allowed and made a, a very important point historically in Italy. So the, it was the occasion to put together top level science, so academia, top level science, together with uh, for instance, uh, manufacturing capabilities that were at that time developed in the same research institution. Um, a charity, so Teleton, was involved and it helped a lot this process. And these different players then was, uh, was the key to become traction for Big Pharma. 
So that was a, a, a nice story because, and I think <coughs> this is one of the reasons why gene therapy is important in Italy because we have this track record and we arrived, uh, uh, you know, for the first time we, we get one got approval. Even if in the States the story is different, the, the narrative is different, they forget about us. <laughs> Patrick, I'm going to put you on the spot. So Paolo mentioned how his company, he believes, has a much lower valuation than it would if he was based here in the United States. We talk a lot about that. We sometimes call that the European discount. <laughs> you know, smart investors take advantage of arbitrage opportunities. And I'm just wondering if you think that that spread over time as our industry becomes more global by shrink. And also, can you explain, like, why does that exist? Like, science is science. Why should it be valued differently somewhere else than maybe it's valued here? All right, how do I not get myself in trouble here? Um, <laughs> maybe two or three years ago, uh, I think the spread was pretty wide. You know, now we have substantial portion of the US listed uh, biotech companies trading under book value, so under their cash on their balance sheet. Uh, so um, it's hard to find many many uh, things that are discounted more than that in the US right now. Uh, that being said, you know, I think it's a cyclic thing. It'll probably come back where there'll be a, you know, a, a nice arbitrage opportunity again. One of the things I've heard, and I don't, I can't speak to this directly, is, you know, I think there's a reason that a lot of the high performing biotech companies are based in the U.S. And, and part of it is the salaries here are, are the highest in the world, right? And so the best scientists want to leave wherever they're from and come work here because they can get paid more money. And so there's probably some bias in terms of, you know, who are the best researchers and some of them end up in the U.S. That being said, there are plenty of, of outstanding biotech companies in Europe, you know, the pharma companies, right? Um, Novartis. Open Nordis, Roche, you know, they, they've, uh, Biogen got their, probably their biggest drug ever uh, from Europe. And so, you know, I think there's still certainly a, a lot of opportunities. Some people just want to stay where their families are, et cetera. Um, but I think the, the idea of you pay a PhD in the US, uh, you know, $150,000 a year, or you go to the UK or Germany or, or Italy and you pay half or a third of that, you know, why are the best scientists going to stay there if they could come here, right? And I think. People, that's on their minds. Yeah. Because Italy is the best place to live. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, but, uh, Kelly, just, just a quick, very quick thing about the evaluation of uh, U.S. companies. I think one of the problems, and to me, maybe I'm wrong, of course, but to me, is a, a distortion, is because the burden rate of, of U.S. companies is huge as compared to the European ones. So, if you spend 100 million per year, then clearly uh, your value today is going to be much more affordable than an Italian company that spends maybe 10 minutes per year. You're not wrong. But there are efficient cash burning US companies too, and I think those get an advantage in the market. Uh, you know, there's a company that had the first really interesting data set in Nash that I think has like 20 employees file for approval in this, you know, this half of the year. So I, I think there are examples of ones that don't fit that criteria, but for, for sure there are a lot of companies that seem to have 10 C-suite executives despite not having a product in clinical trials yet. You know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But if I may add, uh, we should not forget about prices. Yeah. You know, the prices you have here in the US <laughs> compared to what you have in Europe is perhaps a magnitude of difference. Exactly. And then you have a single market, uh, you have a uh, high, uh, biggest pool of patients, compared to the, again, fragmentation that the euro has, because getting a, a product approved in Germany and getting a price in Germany doesn't mean that you're gonna get a similar price in France or, or Italy. Whilst once you are supported by a private sector here, uh, it's, it's, it's a different story. Uh, in, in Europe, uh, all uh, medicines and devices are funded by, the public, uh, by, by public governments. And that's where you have all these issues uh, like the buyback. Uh, that's the reason why Massimiliano Armoget was not here. When you get to a certain uh, uh, level of sales and you're asked by the government to pay back some money because you've done your job. So again, uh, I, I don't want to go uh, deeply into that, but really the, the, the patient has higher value for a company in the US than it does in Europe. Yeah. And that drives all of these salaries 
valuations, you know, exit strategies, <coughs> funds, and so on. And this is something that, uh, to me, is one of the most important uh, uh, factors to consider. Yeah, and I think that pricing difference is most distinct in the rare and orphan disease indications, where here in the United States, the prices can be, you know, so exorbitantly high. Um, let's talk about Euromed. Luigi. Um, tell us about Euromed and some of the innovation that's coming out of your company. Thank you, Lord. Thanks, everyone. And first of all, <coughs> let me bring the greetings from Farm Industria and on behalf of my presidency of the small and medium enterprise that they represent, that are one of the, the part of the backbone of the Italian healthcare manufacturing, and the reason why we are really proud to represent and uh, this uh, important stage. Let me thank you, of course, uh, Sergio Strozzi, uh, Albert Cocito, and uh, hosting, us, hosting us in such an amusing place that uh, we receive for the first time, and not only as a citizen, but as an entrepreneur of the pharmaceutical and healthcare business. Uh, I'm really happy to know that in other part of the world we can have such kind of location where we can have meetings and we can represent the Italian world. So, going back to the company, uh, Euromed is a part of the Petroni Group, which is a conglomerate that runs the pharmaceutical business uh, along uh, uh, all the, the pharmacy chain. So, we are involved in the manufacturing, in packaging, logistics, and so on. And a few years ago, 10 years ago, we started to rebrand part of the business under the Euromed Farm name along Italy, Germany, Spain, Ireland, US where we opened the company in November 2019, and Singapore more than 10 years ago. What is the main aim of the company? We run three different businesses. First of all, we supply, we try to help a pharmaceutical company that wants to launch on the market new products, to, to source, to fulfill, of course, products for the consumers, both from Europe and from the US. You know that the one <coughs> of the topics that we have discussed before, we mentioned the sustainability of the price and how the government could be able to pay such a high prices, and mentioning before you generally the, the, the orphan drugs. Uh, there is a, a huge uh, momentum, in my opinion, that of course the normal company and the pharmaceutical company want to invest in both small molecules or uh, the old molecule, trying to repurpose the new side that you know, uh, we were talking about the markets and, uh, and the company like Greece are the ones that are, will launch the game, new products <coughs> that found this indication, even if we're talking about product more than 50 years. And so we supply the stock from the from, from hand, sourced it from Europe, sourced it from the US, and sourced it from the Far East countries where we have a branch in Singapore. On the other hand, <coughs> I'm, uh, I used to travel to the US for more than 10 years attending a small conference, a big conference like J.P. Morgan, Jeffries, Boston Biotech by a CEO. And they get in touch with, uh, with several CEO of small medium enterprise that wants to launch the, on the market new products for medical need. You know that the time to market in the US is really fast because the payers, is not the government, but are the, the, the insurance company, the doctors and the and so on. But when this company want to launch the product, over in the country, so they get approval by EMA, then they have to negotiate the price among the 27 European countries. And you know it's a really tough, tough task in you know, order to do this. But when you talk about products, only with few patients for each country, you don't have the such kind of financial statement in order to build up from scratch or the company like the big ones. And so what we do, we manage in a full time management, we are able to receive, to distribute, and to store products, and we try to manage in a full time management business process in order to facilitate and to streamline the bridging between US and Europe, and using it, hopefully, Italy as the main gateway for opening a new market um, uh, around the European market. Great, thank you. And, um Getting close to time here, I want to make sure we give all our panelists time. Luca, tell us about your company and the things that you're working on. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm probably a different animal compared to, me, to my colleagues because uh, the, my company is a medical device company. By the way, Italy, life science is not just pharma. <laughs> we have also medical devices. So, 
I'm glad to be the one representing today the, the, the sector. We are a, a, a young company, so the co I'm actually I'm a material scientist by training, so uh, my job was indeed bringing a technology that I developed with colleagues in the university and bringing to a medical product. So we developed electrons for the, sorry, sorry for the, okay, so sorry. We, uh, we develop uh, electrodes for neuromodulation in your monitoring, so they are invasive electrodes that are placed on the surface of the brain during brain surgery to test the integrity between the motor cortex and the muscle during the removal of tumor, or and also for neuromodulation. Uh, and uh, we have now a product approved in Europe and the US. So we are just entering the American market, so the price is very nice moment. Also to be here and to be investors. Great, thank you. Well, we have some great Italian food and wine um, to enjoy, but before we do, I just want to check, does anyone in the audience have any questions or comments or anything to say about what they've heard today? Don't be shy. We're, we're not going to have delicious food and wine unless one brave person... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the first glass of wine goes to the first question. Just by a show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you in the audience are friends visiting the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference from Italy? What about the presence living here? That's the second question. <laughs> how many are Italians living here? And how many are, are U.S. friends? That's great. Well, You didn't ask how many are both. How many are both? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Well, again, the, the goal of this evening is to make connections. So let's have some fun. Let's enjoy some food and wine and mingle. And let's make a lot of those connections tonight. Thank you.